All right. The last couple of people have just popped in and say hello in the chat if you haven't done so already. My name's Karen and I'm going to be running the, the presentation today. So thank you so much for, for joining us this evening, this morning, this afternoon, wherever it is that you may be. I'm wiggling my toes here today on Irrigantia land, which is in far north Queensland, just north of Cairns in a place called Trinity Beach. Um, and I uh, see actually there's some other people on close areas to me as well. So hi to anyone else in Queensland and enjoying the uh, coolish, though not quite so cold weather you might be experiencing down south or to those of you in New Zealand as well. And I see there's someone in the UK as well. And I heard it was going to be a toasty 41 degrees there. So I hope you're enjoying that. That's the sort of weather I like. I want to start with a, a poll, actually, and just get a little bit of an idea about your experience before we go into this. So I'm just going to launch that and that should, should, should pop up on your screens now. So there's three questions there just to get a bit of an idea about your level of using drones and what is your experience with drone mapping. Um, and then a question there about which best describes you. This sort of helped me a little bit with the language that I use throughout my presentation to make sure that I can hopefully cater to everybody's needs as to what sort of things they're looking for. It's quite a bit of a range here as I, I'm seeing this come through. I'm not sure if you see the responses after you respond as well. Um, but I can see there's quite a lot of people, I guess about half the people online have never ever flown before. Then there's a couple of novices, a couple who are a little bit comfortable and very few who are confident. Um, the next question was, what is, what is your level of drone mapping experience? Um, and most people, I guess two thirds don't have any experience and don't know what you don't know. And that's great. It's actually a really good place to start from. And it's good to of course, to not acknowledge when we don't know what we don't know as well. Um, and what best describes you? So a few people online, I guess about a 30 people actually have a drone, which is a really good start. Some have captured some drone mapping data. Um, quite a few of you two thirds would like to learn how to do it. And some interested in, also about two thirds as well, interested in analyzing those data. So that's great. I'll, I'll touch on all of those things. And I see that we've got quite a good mix across the board for us today. So that's great. So what I'd like to do is um, I'm going to go through and talk to you a little bit about, about my background and what it is that I've, I've been using drones for over the past few years. I guess I've been flying now for about eight years or so um, across research and applications as well. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, a little bit about my background. And if you've got questions as we go along, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'm really happy to take them as we go. And I'll just make sure that I keep that chat up. So if you do have questions, some burning, burning question that you want answered as I go, please let me know. Um, and otherwise I'll take questions at the end as well. All right, so let's get started, shall we? I'll just do a little bit about my background, what I've been up to, and I guess how it is that I come to be talking with you about this today. So as I mentioned, I've been flying since about 2013, but if we go a little bit further back for me, my experience is as, as a scientist, for a little over two decades now working on the Great Barrier Reef and I've really been interested in trying to understand one fundamental question and that is quite simply how much live coral do we have on the Great Barrier Reef and I've been doing that in a number of different ways using drones as, as one of the more, more recent technologies that I've been engaged in using I guess. Um, but as we, as I go, as I look at the way that I've, I've been dealing with these types of data across the years, it, it ranges a whole span of different ways that we've been doing this. And, you know, largely when I'm thinking about live coral, these are the types of habitats that I'm interested in. So 
trying to detect is there soft coral, is there hard coral, have we changed to algal areas? What, what are these different things made up of? And these are all underwater photos here. And the way that we go about capturing these data, I guess to, to many of you might, might be familiar if you've captured field data in, in any form, in any type of ecosystem, but a lot of the work that I do is under the water and you know, doing transects or doing grids, taking a lot of photos as, as we go. And at, at, I guess more lately, those types of things that we've been using is just fairly standard digital cameras, but you can see this diver here has, has a cable tied to them and then up at the surface, there's a buoy with a GPS on that. So we're able to see or locate where our photos are taken so that we can uh, map that later. And if we use some very non-techy equipment, really happy with our, with our magna doodles here that we've been using for a couple of decades to capture information underwater. And going from that sort of level up to a little bit more, a little bit more techy, still not totally techy. In this case, what you see here is I'm swimming along just some PVC pipe from Bunnings with three downward facing cameras taking photos every second and this one's at a 45 degree angle taking a video and you can see just here is a, um, a waterproof bag flowable boy here and that's got a gps on top of that as well and really what i'm aiming to do when i'm capturing those data underwater is to be able to create something like this so basically i'm stitching together all of these photos to create a 3D model of the underwater ecosystem that I'm able to measure different features there as well. And looking at being able to figure out, again, the answer to my question of how much live coral do I have on the Great Barrier Reef? And you know, this, this sort of thing is really great, but when we start to look at how we capture these type of data, and this is the top down view of the exact same uh, system, I guess. This is one of my colleagues, Dr. Javier Leon from the University of the Sunshine Coast, and I'm flying the drone, so I'm not actually in this picture, but you'll see he's got the same setup. He's got this little bar, and he's got the three GoPros facing down. You'll see his buddy quite a way back here and they're swimming along capturing these photos as they go and I guess I just want you to appreciate just how small he is with respect to now what you see coming in and I'm not a great videographer so it's not exactly a smooth transition but you'll see that we pan all the way back out to the reef there and so if you think about being able to capture these types of data sets under the water compared to the size of the reef becomes a little bit challenging. And so this is the same reef. So this is Heron Reef on the Southern Great Barrier Reef off the coast of Gladstone, if you're familiar with that area. And that video was taken around about here, but I'm just indicating on the screen here, this is a satellite image. So you get a bit of an appreciation for how big of an area it is. So from west to east, it's 11 kilometers and about four kilometers north south here. And this is just one reef and for context, You'll be able to see this here. So here's the reef I was just talking about all the way down the south, southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. This area around here is Gladstone. And if we step all the way out again, this is the area I'm talking here. So you can see the entire Great Barrier Reef. And it's actually made up of about 3,000 individual reefs. And for those Aussies, that's about the area of Victoria plus Tasmania. So really, really big area. And you'll see that I was just working in this tiny area here. So let's zoom all the way back in to the area that I'm looking at. So satellite image freely available. And this, these are data sets that I've been using for a couple of decades. And just remember back to my key question, how much live coral do we have on the Great Barrier Reef? Now I want to zoom into this particular area. So this is the island here. It's about 800 meters long by 400 meters north south. There's a forested area here, University of Queensland research station on the southern part of the western portion of the island and the resort on the northern part. So as a citizen scientist or scientist, definitely try and get to the research station. It's cheaper to stay there and I think it's a lot more of an authentic feel to be on a research station um, than at, at a resort as well. So I feel really privileged to get to stay there. But well, let's zoom all the way into that. And I just want to ask you a question. Perhaps you can let me know in the chat. Could you tell 
me and from this picture here, would you be able to estimate, yes, no, or maybe, the amount of live coral that you would see in this image here? So you got some no's, some negatives, maybe some not sure's as well. Yeah, in percentage. So yeah, really, really challenging question. And I guess that the key to this is that every single square or pixel here um, measures about 30 meters by 30 meters on the ground. And so within that, you're going to have a big mix of some live coral, some not live coral. So let's zoom in a little bit further, shall we? And let's go into this area here. Now, this is the best available commercial satellite data. This, this costs money. This is about the same as what you see on Google Earth. And I'll ask the same question again. Are you able, would you be able to tell me where the live coral is in this image? So yes, no, maybe, not sure, anything like that. Yeah, so is it the dark patches? Well, it could be, but that also could be algae. And so it's really, really difficult. And this is what we get from satellite. Now, satellite is really useful if we're interested in the entire Great Barrier Reef. But if we want to think back to my set question, how much live coral do we have? Big challenge. And so that's where I start using drones. So once more in the chat here, the exact same question. If I gave you this image, would you be able to tell me where the live coral is? Yeah, bingo, you can definitely see where it is. And, you know, of course it helps you if you're a little bit trained in the area. So I can tell you that sort of these bits around the edge here, so the brownie bits, this is all live coral. Same with the edge of these bombies here, the, the gray, grayer patches. Uh, the dead coral, we've got lots of sand, some rubble around here. Um, we've got some sea cucumbers here, which I'll talk about in a moment as well. But so lots and lots of different types of coral. And, you know, it's a, it's a magic day. No, there's no filter on this. This is just one of the magic days at Erin where the tide was very low. You can see the ripples up here, but the tide drops beautifully low and you can get some of these corals exposed. And, and it is pretty magic when you get data sets like this. But this is the key reason that I use drone data is to be able to get at my, at my core science question, right? So let's have a look at the way we actually capture these types of data when we're, when we're using drones. So this just a little animation here will show this drone as it goes off. So it's flying up and back in the sky like it's a lawnmower. It's controlled by a GPS. And once it hits the end point, it's going to come all the way back to home. And then what happens is we take all the photos that it's captured as it's going and stitch them together. So there's a question just there in the chat about how high I was flying with that previous image that I showed. That's from a 20 meter altitude flight. So I keep it really, really low. And I'll talk a little bit about how we decide what altitude we're flying at um, soon as well. So just that animation that just showed you there, just to give you a bit of a, bit of a feel for how this drone goes backwards and forwards. Now, what I'd like to do is just to actually jump onto one of the apps that I use and demonstrate how easy it is to actually create one of these mapping missions. So I'm just going to bring this over. I'm going to second screen up here. So hopefully you can see this app. This I'm just using this on my phone here, but you should be able to see it on the main screen there. Just let me know um, if that's not popping up there. So what I'm going to do is to give you a quick demonstration on how I create that mission. And it's pretty simple to do. So in this case, I'm using an app that's created by Autel. So that's based on one particular drone that I use, which is an Autel drone. There's a variety of different apps that you can use. This is a freely available one for this particular brand of drone. I'm going, going to go into this mission here and I get a couple of different ways that I can decide or what type of mission I'm going to create. And as I showed you before, that kind of lawnmower pattern that would set up either to be in a rectangle if I really wanted it in a block, but I've got a little bit more flexibility if I choose a polygon. So let's Control go into this here. Phone disconnected. 
Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide on a place where I would like to fly. So I'm just going to zoom into a location and Today I'm going to say let's let's actually go to one of my local beaches. This is a place called Kawara Beach in far north Queensland. And I'm going to zoom roughly into an area that I'm interested in. And to just, just actually zoom back out a little bit and I'll just show you. Gives you a bit of an indication where there's an airport as well. So you were to see this area is where the, the main runway is and some areas of no-fly zones as well. So anyway, let's come back here, come back to the beach. And let's say I would like to create a mission in this, roughly in this area here. So I'm just going to tap on, tap on this one here. Um, just a quick question. Do I need to get G uh, ground control points or real-time kinematic GPS to get accurate data? Otherwise, they're not necessarily aligned properly. Really good question. And yes, things do depend on the level of accuracy that you would like to get out of your data, but you don't need to have high-end kit to get some data out. All right, so what we, what we can see here is if I zoom in a little bit more, you'll see that when I click to drop a mapping mission, it has automatically created this lawnmower pattern for me. A couple of things to take note of when it does this. So it's, it's telling me up here that this is gonna take 18 minutes and 43 seconds. It will cover an area of 96,000 square meters and take approximately 499 photos. Now, I just this particular drone that I use, I like to get my flights down to around about 15 minutes. It sort of depends on the situation, but that also allows me to make sure I've got plenty of buffer time for when the aircraft comes back and a local person that's walking their dog decides to hang around and want to talk to me while the dog's yapping at my drone and I've got plenty of battery left so I don't end up with any crash at the end. So you always want to make sure that your drone is on the ground easily with 20% battery left. So the first thing for me is I need to reduce this amount of time from 18 minutes. So there's a couple of different ways that I can do this. But what I'm gonna to do to start with, I'm just gonna move some of these dots here. And what I actually want to do is to map this whole area of mangroves. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm just doing this on my touch screen as I move around. Um, I can click any of these pluses here to, narrow in areas. I, I do want to keep it as rectangular as possible. And I also want to make sure that I cover an area larger than what I actually want because the edges of my maps are not always as, as good as the internal bit. So as you see, I'm sort of bringing that in. Um, I'm now up to 20 meters, which is a little bit much for me. So I've got a couple of choices. I, I could decide that I want to make the area smaller, or another thing that I could actually do is to fly higher. And once I fly higher, you'll see that that will spread my flight lines out and I'll be able to cover a larger area because every single photo that the drone takes is slightly slightly larger. Yeah, so there's just a comment in the chat there that there's there's plenty of other apps to use as well that, that do the job really well. It sort of depends on if you're using Android or iOS and the brand of drone you're using as well. So if you're using a DJI drone, for example, this isn't the app that you'd use, but it's the concepts are exactly the same. So let's get this down to under 20 meters, 20, 20 minutes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in and I'm going to, I could, I could save that. I'm just going to edit some of these parameters here. So the first one here is we see that it's at 60 meters altitude. So I can go up to 120 meters legally in Australia. So let's see what happens if I bump that up. You'll see it's dynamically shifting the width, the, the gaps between my flight lines. And I'm already down at 13 minutes here and I'm up at 99 meters, for example. So if I took that all the way up to 120, my legal limit here in Australia, um, let's see how we go all the way down at 12 minutes. So that would mean I could extend the area that I want to fly, perhaps, if that's what I want to do. Now, what you see happens is as we play with the altitude, what changes then is the ground sample distance or the size of the individual pixels. So we can, again, do that dynamically. So I'm going to shift this down 
bring it to a lower altitude. At the moment, you can see it's 2.7 centimeters per pixel. Um, so if I decide I actually need a little bit more detail than that, um, I can bring that, bring the altitude down and you'll get a higher resolution pixel size. And there's a little bit of maths that goes into that. If you like trigonometry, it's a little bit of fun to go through. If you don't, you can always play with the apps to, um, to do this. Um, but there is, there's some key things, the key ways to decide what's the best altitude. Um, and I can talk about that a little bit later, or you can read about it in, a, in our ebook as well. So I can scroll across the bottom here. There was a question about my overlap and side lap, which is a really great question. So what we, what we have here is this front overlap. And basically this is the amount of overlap you get between every consecutive photo that you take as you fly. And then we have side lap, which is the overlap between these flight lines. So you're taking photos, drone turns around, takes photos, how much, how much is the overlap between the sides or side lap. Now, this is actually a little bit variable as to what's required depending on the ecosystem that you're in. But a really good rule of thumb that I like to work with is 80-80. So if you just do 80% overlap, 80% side lap, that'll pretty much work in most situations. Some you can drop all the way down to about 65% and you're going to cover a much larger area if you do that as well. Um, but it's you're always better to have the redundancy and make sure you get good data rather than drop back and end up with terrible data as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about the quality of data that we want to achieve. So I'm going to change my 70% side lap and bump that up to 80%. And you'll see once again, that that's dynamically affecting my flight time and the number of photos that I take. So basically it's a little bit of trial and error as you, as you move around and get some of that get some of those parameters right to work properly for your um, for your ecosystem, for your location, and that sort of thing. So question there, do you have a preferred ground sample distance or is flight time your main concern? No, this is this is a critical question. So it's really, really important to work out not what your preferred ground sample distance is, but what is the feature that you're trying to map in the first place? So a rule of thumb, and I can give you some links on this later as well, is that a rule of thumb is you want to work out what's the size of the smallest feature you're interested in. So for me, you know, maybe it's a sea cucumber or it's a live coral, whatever. How big is that thing? Divide it by 10, again, rule of thumb, and that's the size of the pixel size you need. So for example, if I need to map something of the minimum size, of 20 centimeters, then my pixel size needs to be two centimeters or my ground sample distance. So a little bit of jargon there. And if you're if you're one of the people that um, put down, you've got no drone experience, no drone mapping experience, and this is going over the head, that's perfectly fine. I get where you get where you're coming from, but I can give you some resources to talk about this as well. Um, but to answer your question there, Lockie, it's important to know what you want to map first and then figure out what that pixel size is that's going to match that. Because if you went the other way and said, and said, oh, you know, but I just really need to cover a really large area, and, and I have done this in the past and I still see people doing it as well, you end up with a large area of data that's useless to you. So you're much better off having a smaller area of data with the right pixel size that matches the information you're trying to capture. Question in the chat also, does the program have a feature to enable a varying altitude? Yes, that's also another really good question. So what you'll see here is that I've made my altitude as, where did we go with? It's at 98 meters at the moment. So that's relative to the location where I took off the drone. There are other software packages that do what's called terrain following, and that will keep the drone at 98 meters above the ground where the drone is at, as opposed to referencing your takeoff point. Um, so it varies. So most of my work is over water, so it's actually not that big a concern for me, but it is in other situations as well. Uh, a comment in the chat there also to think about which, which direction your grid lines are with respect to the wind. So this also depends on if you're in a, in a marine environment as well, because you often want to make sure that your flight lines are, are perpendicular to the sun. 
So there's some variations around that as well. Um, thanks for the comment there, Jack. I'm glad you're enjoying it. All right, cool. So let's let's keep moving from here. So let's let's say you 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 crack on. You've you've got these data. Um, so you or so you're ready to fly. And then what I'll do is so I would get on site. I double check my plan because usually I would make make my plan at home, make sure everything's okay. Get on site, check everything again. And then if I'm all good to go, you can basically hit this blue button here and the drone's going to take off, run its mission, come back and land. And I say that generically because that's actually not the way that I run an operation. So I always like to take off manually, get the drone out of the way and then send it on its automatic mission. It also gives me a little bit more practice time with my thumbs because most of the time that I fly is drone in an automated mission capture mode and it doesn't actually allow me a lot of time to continue practicing my skills on manual flight as well. So I always like to take off manually, fly on the mission, and then I'll call it back manually as well. So it's a really good, good way to practice just in case for whatever reason you lose connectivity with GPS and you do have to manually fly back as well. Hey, great point in the chat there as well. Um, someone said that to make sure you get a drone that can do the autonomous flight. And, you know, this, this is a, a really, really good point. And I urge you, if, you're, if you want to get into drone mapping, please just reach out to me and say, hey, I want to get into drone mapping. This is my budget. I'm thinking this drone. Is this one okay? Because there's a couple of things that you don't want. You don't want to get a drone that has a built-in screen. So some of the drones have these right, amazing beautiful high definition screens that don't allow you to use third party apps like this third this app here so if you if you can't plug in your own de mobile device then you can't map with it and then DJI so one of the biggest brands you create are using the or providing the consumer level drones that we use quite a lot their latest drones that they're putting out onto the market they're not opening the SDK or the brain of the drone to the third party app creators. And so you're no longer able to app, <laughs> no longer able to map with some of their drones as well. So please, if you want to buy a drone, please, please, please reach out to me and ask if the drone that you want to buy is appropriate and I can point you in the right direction there as well. Do the apps work on Androids, um, Androids or iOS? Yes, depends. Um, depends on which app you're using. There are some that work better on iOS, some that work better on Android. I tend to find they do work better on iOS, but, um, but there's Android apps there as well. Yes, so many, so many different apps. Yes, absolutely. I try and keep, try and cut it down just to the, the most basic ones. And basically they do all work very similarly as well. Um, Jones also popped in the chat that with your Air 2S there, Mark, you can use DroneLink and Jones writing a blog about that as well. So wait out for that one and, and that will provide some guidance there too. Question, are you using the camera that comes with a drone or something custom? You know what, so I actually have a range of different drones. Uh, so I have some big ones with some custom, custom cameras and I do have some really off the shelf stuff as well. My personal preference is off the shelf with the inbuilt camera works really, really well. I just, I feel that de-stresses me quite a lot. My, my largest drone is, it, it weighs 35 kilos, could carry a small child and is built to carry a number of different camera systems on it. And I just find it so stressful. I much rather the small little drones that I can take out and get, um, get, get using, which is mostly what I'm talking with you about today. All right, so, so let's say we've planned our mission, we're happy with the parameters there, we've sent it off and we've captured some data. So I wanna have a, have a chat with you next about some of the types of products that we see, some of the data that we see and how we can look at analyzing those as well. So let me do this. All right, so we should be back on my PowerPoint slide. Let me know if that's not the case. So one of the projects that I've been working on for the past few years is to look at, at sea cucumbers. And the, 
I, I showed really briefly an example of some of the sea cucumbers that I could see in my drone imagery there. And the way that this particular project started was that I, again, you know, back to my looking at live coral stuff and I, and I realized that I could see sea cucumbers in my drone imagery. And I actually posted that on Twitter and I said, hey, I can see sea cucumbers. Does anyone like sea cucumbers? I've got the data, let's chat. And what's happened over the past couple of years is some really beautiful collaborations with uh, some people who were quite random to me, but that's the, I guess that's the way science moves ahead sometimes. And I really enjoy the work that we do with sea cucumbers. And so these are some of the different species that we're interested in looking at and then trying to work out, it's great to have our our scuba diver or our snorkeler in the water, but what can we do with drawing data that can help us there as well? And so this is actually the original image that I popped up on Twitter and has grown into a variety of different projects. And I'll talk about some of those in a moment as well. So you can see a number of these black sea cucumbers. This is Holothuria atra. And we can see another one here, which I don't actually, I don't know the species name of offhand about of this one as well. But you, you see that they're, they're really clear in this, in this beautiful drone imagery as well. So you start, this started the question, well, well, if I can see these image, if I can see the sea cucumbers, what is some data that I can get out of that? And this is from one of my, one of my students. So I, I'm, I'm an academic at James Cook Uni. So I, I have the the pleasure of working with a large number of students and of course that, that does give me a little bit of a labor advantage on occasion as well and this is the work of not actually not just one student it was a group of students this year in 2017 that analyzed our data and this is heron reef where i showed before and this is an example of one of those sets of images that we've got up here we had data from 2016 and 2017 you can see the individual dots there is where they've gone around and, and counted the sea cucumbers and there's a couple of different species which is where you might see some of the different colors there so lots of this maroon one which is that black atra and then a couple of different other ones as well and so that's great, you know, if you think about just capturing the, the drone data just like that and counting those sea cucumbers, but what does that actually mean? What's the scientific question? Well, so our question is actually not just about the sea cucumbers and where they are, and that's interesting, but the first project we've really worked on is not just looking at their distribution, but looking at their poo. And so if you haven't had any experience with sea cucumbers before, one of the cool things about them is that I guess they, they act as like the hoover on the reef, right? So they're eating all the eating in all the sediment, pooping it back out nice and clean, and they're providing a, a range of different ecosystem services to the reef. And so we asked, well, if, if we actually knew how much poo one sea cucumber did, and we could measure that, so we could do that per day and then calculate that, that poo per year, and then combine that with our estimates of what well, counts our counts from drones and scaled up to how many sea cucumbers we're estimating across the entire reef, we could then work out well how much poo or how much sea cucumber poo we see on the entire reef. And so this is our this is our results here. So basically we've we worked out that on, on Heron Reef we could work out. Um, that there's approximately five Eiffel Towers worth of sea cucumber poo on that reef. I'm just going to pop in the chat there a, a link also to that study if anyone's interested in reading up more on that one. So it was a bit of fun, um, but, it, you know, we got some of the work going. But we also realized that if I don't have lots of students on hand being able to count on my individual sea cucumbers, there's got to be a better way. And I see that Joan is also on, online here today. And so this is some of her work looking at, well, if we can identify these sea cucumbers, how can we use artificial intelligence to do this as well? And so basically her work, and this is part of her master's project at JCU, was to look at using artificial intelligence and deep learning to identify where these sea cucumbers are and in this particular area, 
we've had the drone fly backwards and forwards. We've actually removed the overlapping photos so that we're not double counting cucumbers. And then you can see the footprint of each individual photo color coded according to the amount of sea cucumbers per meter squared as well. So huge numbers of sea cucumbers in this area of Hideaway Bay, which is just off the coast of North Queensland, sort of in the Townsville region. And the link to that paper is there also there in the chat for you, if you like. And so taking this all this back, and because again, we remember my, my core question is looking at how much live coral there is, and sea cucumbers are one component now of a lot of the work that I do, but I want to take it back to the live coral question and how we how we actually extract that. But we and we use similar techniques. So we're looking at photos, they could be individual photos or they could be these stitched together photos. And so what's happening here is we take the photo run them through some form of algorithm. And in this case, this is another master's project from one of my other JCU students, really trying to again, extract where that live coral is compared to rock or dead coral and algal covered coral as well, and sandy areas as well. And looking at how we do that in individual photos, and then how we use that in a way to map large areas of the reef. And I've used a very different configuration for this particular data capture. So you'll see it, it's actually going across areas that are aligned with where snorkelers have gone in the field as well. So instead of having all this overlapping drone footage, in this case, we've flown the drone and I used, I used a different app, it's called Litchi. I saw someone mention that in the chat here as well, to take a photo every 40 meters as we've gone along here in this format. And so this was three different drone flights to capture all these data points here as well. And you can see they're color coded according to the, the amount of live coral that's been extracted in those areas. So the darker area is more live coral there as well. So I'll pop the link to that paper in the chat as well if anyone's interested in reading a little bit more about that too. Uh, just a couple of questions there is what's the maximum water depth where, the drone, where drone imaging is effective? That's a, that's a great question and as we have so many great questions, the answer is it depends. So this is going to depend on the clarity of water and largely the amount of ripples or the sea state of the surface of the water as well. So when we look at, uh, at some of the drone imagery that we get on you know, some of those amazing glass out days, we can do a really great job. Um, and other days, you could have a really small amount of water, but if it's choppy, you've got no luck. And I think realistically, it's very much along the lines of if you're on a boat and you looked over the side of the boat and you could see what the live coral is at that time, then we're going to get a reasonable result with the drone as well. But if it's if it's choppy, you don't have much luck. And of course, I'm showing you the most perfect examples here as well. I guess, you know, that's just kind of the way it goes. But we've got plenty of times where it's not perfect. All right, so that's lots and lots of reef stuff, but I know that many of you are interested in other ecosystems as well. So just a quick couple of other examples, and then I'll show you how we put some of these data together as well and platforms for doing that. So this is an example of a data set that I captured in Central Australia. And this, this area that you see here, this is, a, this is a large study site from Dr. Christine Schlesinger at Charles Darwin Uni, just outside of Alice Springs. And she's interested in what you see here, this kind of grayish stuff around here is buffle grass, which is a, a plant that was introduced into Central Australia to decrease the amount of dust and also to provide fodder for cattle. But what it's done, of course, like many introduced species, is it compete the native grasses and, and it's actually a major fire hazard as well because it's quite combustible and grows to a large height, et cetera. So if you can actually see here that there's an area where it's greener. And so this is, this is her exclusion site. So she goes through and meticulously removes all the buffer grass and then maps this area. So it's about 150 meters this way. Um, she maps it by hand to look at the regeneration of the native vegetation and all the, the fauna species in there as well. And her actual study site extends about the same distance 
down to the southern part of this as well. So this is the uh, this I guess this is the treatment and this is the, the standard site here and she's looking at the difference in native flora and fauna once the buffalo grass is excluded here and so you can see it in terms of a, a difference in greenness in the in the photography here but one of the byproducts that we create when we've captured all these overlapping photos is we create these three-dimensional models as well and so what you see here is the height of the vegetation above the ground. And you can see really clearly the outline of the exclusion site here. And if we do this over time, we can actually see that some of the woody vegetation that's coming back is actually growing in height as well, which is really nice. And we can start to measure that. So this flight took me about six minutes to capture, super fast, 60 meters altitude, amazing clarity in some of in this data. And this, this was done with a digital SLR off a custom built platform. So slightly different to some of the other data sets I've shown. Another example, this is with a standard off the shelf. This was with a DJI Mavic Pro drone with a, this, this is a school up in Weeba in far North Queensland, up in the Cape and part of a training program that I had running with that school up there and largely trying to calculate the amount of tree shade they have on their school campus. And again, this is a really nice example where you can see how we've stitched the photos together and where we get this three-dimensional model. So you can see all the buildings and the difference in height between them and their surrounding area as well. So what I want to do next is just to give you a bit of a feel of what raw data would look like and then how we take it to some of these models as well. So should now see, let me know if you don't see, but you should see uh, on the screen uh, a website here. And what you can see, this, this is my, here's one I collected earlier. This is the same beach that I planned out on my, my app. So here's the photos that I captured theoretically. You can see my overlapping photos as I scroll through. And what I can do here is have a look at the metadata of this location. You'll see that I captured 383 photos in this flight as I was flying backwards and forwards. And we see some of the specs of the drone that I was flying at the time. I've, already, I've also noted that I was flying at 80 meters altitude with that 80% overlap and side lap that I was talking about. So they're the raw photos. You'll see that they do look very similar to each other as they're side by side because of that overlap. And then what we do here is we actually create that what's called an author mosaic and so we can drop that on the map there as well and so you can you can go in and instead of just looking at the 300 odd individual photos we're using computer software to stitch them together so basically it identifies features that it can see in one photo compared to the next and brings them all together and creates that three-dimensional model there as well and so that in that way you're able to come come in and start to look at different patterns in your ecosystem and for me this particular site is interesting because of this area of mangrove dieback so this is just a beach just down the road from me I originally started mapping it to look at coastal erosion. And when I first put the drone up, I was like, wow, actually there's this massive area of mangrove dieback that you don't see from the beach. You don't see from any of the local footpaths or roads, and it's just not getting captured otherwise. So it's just impossible to see where it is or even know that it's occurred. So we can start to have a look at it like this. We can then even start to make some measurements as well. If we want to look at this particular location and start to draw boundaries on what we see, for example. So let's pop it up. And what I'm going to do is, and I'll, I'll show you this, this website, actually, I will pop it in the chat for you right now. So you, you're able to have a bit of a play as well with any of the data sets that are available already. So say I want to create, I want to see how much of an area is covered by dead mangroves. Um, I can do that. And then all I'm going to do is, sometimes it takes a little while to load while I'm, uh, while I'm zooming as well. So let me make a refresh. OK. 
can't see it exactly at the moment, but let's say my area of dead mangroves is around this area here. And I can start to create my map by doing that. And probably really, really tiny on your screen, but I can see that's an area of 9,800 9, meters square. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit more for that. There we go. And so we can we can change the colors of that. We can we can draw lines for distances and add extra annotation, anything like that. It's really, really easy to do to start to start to build your basic maps. You can alternatively push it directly to a GIS pl platform if that's what you're familiar with using. But in terms of being able to use this in a really simple way, um, this is this is also a great way to get started. So in the in the last part, what I'd like to do is, and I've I've answered some of the questions as we as we go, but I'd like to tie this all together to think about you've you've decided you want to go out and you want to create some drone mapping for a particular reason. So what are some of the top tips that are going to make this work properly? Because as we say in the fitness industry, I and I I'm a group fitness instructor as well, and so I really really enjoy my fitness and. There's this, this idea that you can't out-train a bad diet. So it doesn't matter how many marathons you run, if your nutrition is bad, it, you know, the garbage in type scenario, then, then you're actually not going to get a good result in the end. And I like to think of it the same for the data I capture as well. So you basically you can't out-process bad data. So the key is to capture really good data in the first place. So here's my top tips for making sure that we capture really good data when we're out and about in the first place. So number one is absolutely safety first. So it's really obviously your responsibility to make sure that you know the local regulations, what the, the laws are, and make sure that you're abiding by that and you know how to operate your drone safely as well. They're pretty easy to follow, but it can be quite, quite really nasty if you don't follow just some of the really basic things. So let's just make sure we get that done first. Um, the next one is to choose a mission planning app. So don't try to fly manually. You know, you absolutely can, um, but much, much better to get an app that's going to do all of this for you. So it sort of depends on the drone that you've got and then the mobile device you're using as well. There's options there. And yes, these are free as well. So yes, there are paid ones, but you absolutely don't need to use paid apps to get started with mapping. Question, how achievable would it be to fly low below the mangrove canopy to capture soil erosion? Challenging with stuff in the way and challenging to get a reasonable GPS signal. So it's absolutely not impossible, but there's challenges there as well. Um, thank you so much uh, for popping in the CASA regulations there. So yes, there are regulations that are Australian wide, but then some, some local areas, say Brisbane City Council, have bylaws that allow you or don't allow you to fly in certain areas as well. So it's really useful to make sure that you get in the right groups and ask the right questions for the area that you're interested in. Do drone missions sometimes violate privacy? That's, that's another great question. So yeah, absolutely, they, they can do, right? They, uh, so when you're thinking about where you fly, you have the Civil Aviation Safety Authority regulations, which is all about the safety stuff, but then you've just got the privacy law that you need to deal with as well. So that's no different to if you're wandering around with your camera phone and thinking about, thinking about who and what you're taking photos of as well. So it's, it's a good way to, it's, it's a good thing to really be aware of what you're doing. And I guess realistically, you're pretty rarely mapping something that's lower than, you know, maybe about 60 meters altitude. And from that, you can't really identify people. So that's less of an issue but you also are not allowed to fly directly over the top of people. So there's, there's all these things that, are in, that sort of play off each other as well. All right, so let's have a look. So up to number two. Number three, make sure that you plan to cover an area larger than what you actually need, right? So if you're interested in this area of mangroves, build out, okay? So it's always easy to scale back in once you've captured the data, but the, at the edges of any author mosaic are never ever as good as the center. So make sure you cover that larger area. 
It's important to cover at least three parallel lines when you do this. So if you remember when I did on my app, I pulled out a number of different lines and make sure you've got at least three, otherwise the, the models don't really work so well. Again, not, not always, sometimes you can get it going, but if you've got your three, you've got a much better chance of it working. Some apps will see if you want to fly up and back and then cross that as well and then maybe round it about. Not necessary, it depends on what you want to do, but on the whole, I generally find that they provide a, in, an inferior result and obviously they cover a far less of an area as well, so I stay away from those. The altitude, remember to figure out what's the smallest feature you want to identify first, divided by 10, that'll give you a pixel size and that will control your altitude. So you go back the other way, rather than saying what altitude do I want, what's the feature I want to identify? Rule of thumb, go with 80 overlap, 80 side lap. It'll, it'll always work for you. When you wanna, if you wanna do a little bit more trial and error, you can reduce that. But at least if you start out with 80, 80, you're in a good way in that way. You only need to remember one number, makes it easy. So the way that works, here's my photos, overlap, overlap, and then there's my side lap. Number seven, set your camera at an idea, which means it's looking directly down. Yes, I have accidentally flown an entire mission with it facing out. I was not paying attention, did not look at the photos as they were coming in and missed light. So yeah, double check that that, that works. And you know, by, by default, the, um, the apps will set your camera flying directly down as well. The timing of your data capture absolutely matters. So if you're in a terrestrial environment, look for around about midday. Otherwise, if you're, if you're in marine environments, you want morning or afternoon, so you don't have the sun in the middle of your photos. That completely destroys everything. You want to use a fast SD card and change out between every single flight. So that way, if something goes wrong with your drone, you don't lose an entire day's worth of data capture. SD cards don't cost that much and you don't even need them that big when they are flying with between each flight. So I just have 16 gig SD cards and it's great. Make sure you know how to manually call the drone back. So drones off flying its mission, any problems, make sure you can bring it manually home safely. Alrighty, so I just wanted to go into two of my key challenges and how we're going about solving them and hopefully how I might be able to help you as well. So throughout my career, I've had this big issue of being able to store and then able to share my data with my colleagues and students. Um, and then I also really wanna be able to help others to process and analyze their data easily as well. And I guess these are some of the groups that I work with. I do work with a lot of schools, teachers and students, a lot of traditional, traditional owner ranger groups as well. And realistically, they don't wanna spend a lot of time working through using the software, the hardware, having the licenses and having that capacity to do that as well. So I really wanted to be able to have something where I could solve these challenges together. And then my final challenge was really this thing that I realized that there's people around the world like me who are capturing data and their data are all sitting in silos. But what if we actually had them all together, we could bring it all together and actually collectively use that in a, in a system that's fair, and by fair, I mean findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And I guess, you know, you're all into citizen science, so I'm sure you know what that means and the value of that as well. So that's, that's something that's, that I'm really, really passionate about. So when I think about that, and I think about, you know, how is it that I might be able to help you? Um, so a couple of questions for you. So just thinking about for yourself, are you interested in mapping? Would you like to learn more about how to use a drone? Do you need to help processing your data? Do you need data storage space that can get quite large? And would you like to access drone data from other people as well? So if, if you answered yes to any of these questions, then I think that there's, there's a space for us to be able to help you out through the work that we're doing at GeoNadia. And so what I'd like to offer at this stage is, is to say, well, we have an online drone mapping course available that will go into a lot more depth of the various things that I've raced through this evening being able to plan and execute your missions, a little bit about undertaking field survey data, thinking about where you store your data, how to process it, and then some basic analyses as well. And if you are a member of AXA, 
you can have our online drone mapping course for free. And so all you need to do is watch your email for a message from us and and we can get you into that if that's what if you would like to join us in that course if you're not a member um, but you would like to do the drone mapping course we've popped in a 50 percent off discount code there the discount code being axa and i'll just put the link into our drone mapping course now into the chat as well um, for anyone that would like to access that all right so with that that's the main content of what i wanted to go through i'm really happy to um to hang out and answer some questions but also being mindful of time and i said i'd be 55 minutes i'm i'm at the 57 but of course happy to hang a little i would like to get a little bit of feedback so i've launched just a i've launched a poll there and it would love your responses to that poll as well and otherwise i'm happy to jump in and answer any questions that you may have and if i've missed I'll just flick through the chat and see what i've missed do i have any ideas for high school activities oh, my goodness jason i have so many ideas for high school activities what i would like you to do though is go to our sister program i'll just pop that in the chat uh, SheMaps.com is our our high school, our high school and primary school engagement program. Loads and loads of stuff for high schools. Um, please feel free to jump in there as well. Yes, I am recording the webinar, so it, I believe it will be sent out to you to the email that you used when you registered as well. So, yep, happy to send that through. Um, and the copy of that, yeah, same, same. So to your email, what else have I missed? If you, if I've missed your question and you want to drop it back in the chat, um, please feel free to. Otherwise, you can also get me on email. The email is still on the screen on the bottom there. Uh, feel free to shoot us an email or on socials as well. If you like the webinar, we'd love to hear about it. Open source drone data. So let me let me show you where you go. I did give you a super quick demo. Here we go. So my site that I showed you at Kawara, Kawara Beach, if we zoom out, let's go to the whole world. And you'll see drone data from over 30 countries, more than 200,000 images available there loads of stuff for you to start playing with as well um, so the i will drop in the link once more into the chat for you to check that out there as well there we go anything else copy of the chat yep good one i will i will also um, do that. But if you would like to grab a copy of the chat right now, in the chat box down the bottom, there's three little dots. If you click on that, you should be able to hit save chat. But otherwise, I'll do that as I exit as well. And happy to send that through. I, s I see that I've still got plenty of people online. So again, happy to stick around. What data are you after that's the most urgent, mangroves or reefs, et cetera? You know what, it's, it's a good question. And I'm I'm after data that that is in areas where people are passionate about. So I think if you have a local ecosystem that you care about and you would like to be able to, to document change in those areas or have scientists work on those data, that uh, you know that it's that's reef, that's rainforest, that's mangrove, whatever it is, then would love to see your data on the platform. If you go over to the Great Barrier Reef, we've got a huge amount of drone data all up and down the reef. Um, there, a lot of it's mine, but there's more of it that's that's been captured by other people as well, um, because that's the area that I'm passionate about. So I'd be really happy to help to work with, particularly any citizen science groups that um that that are keen to to work on mapping their local ecosystems that that match in this space um 
question what have we got my email i will pop you back up on the screen there as well um so just down the bottom there um hello at gnadia.com i'll pop it in the chat there as well there you go there's my email happy to receive an email with questions or you can get me a karen at gnadia.com as well Would I like to repost the original poll? I don't know if I can repost that poll, I'm sorry. Um, you've just become a member of AXA. Can you expect him? Can you expect mail? Yes, absolutely. So if you're a member of AXA, we will cross-check the, the people who've registered for this webinar with those who are members of AXA. If you're a member of AXA, you'll get the offer to be, have the course for free. If you're not, you'll get the 50% um, the discount code in your email as well. So totally, um, totally over to you to jump in and get going with that as well. Um, is there an idea about what organizations or groups are using the data provided? Yeah, great question. At this stage, when we're, we're not working a huge amount with people who are using other people's data, so that are it is available for others to use, and there and I know of various research projects that are being done on that, but it's not it's actually not a huge focus of ours to to build on the analytics side at this stage. But that will become more and more important as we get more and more people putting data in as well. Most of the people on the platform at this stage are using their own data. More than happy to help facilitate people using others data, other data as well. Um, the Zambia mash, Mapping Initiative. Cool, I will check that out, thanks. Thank you, Ben. Um, yes, and I would love to see more data over Africa as well. I, I have some contacts over there. Certainly if you've got others that you'd like to do intros to or share them, share the website with them, that would be amazing. Any of that word of mouth is obviously really helpful as well. Do we have anything else? Anything else that I can cover for you? So I, I highly recommend you jump onto the Junadea page and have a look at the data, the data that are there. If you have your own drone, if you already know how to do drone mapping, jump out, give it a go. If you have data, absolutely, we'd love to see it up there. Please feel free to upload. And if you're not in that space yet, um, stay in touch. You've got, what well, you can sign up to our mailing list. We so about heaps and heaps of different really cool applications of drone data on our blog as well. So lots of good options there too. All right, I think we're winding down for those questions. Uh, camera specs, focal length, shutter speeds. Yes, a whole other area <laughs> to get into. And again, it depends on the camera that you're using. Um, so yeah, definitely out of scope, but there's, there's some really good research on, on looking into that as well, but a lot of the time the app is, is defining that for you and the defaults work really well. From an environmental mining rehab imaging, what could you mention? So I'm not sure what that question is. Um, maybe you can rephrase that question for me about environmental mining rehab. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to say good night then. Thanks so much, everybody, for attending. I will make sure that I save the chat and we'll make sure that you get a copy, copy of the chat, copy of the recording and the, um, and the discount codes as appropriate as well. Thanks for joining. Hope you got something out of it. And I look forward to maybe seeing your drone data in the future as well.